The following program is a Podcast One.com production. He started in a small town in Texas. Worked his ass off to become one of the most famous wrestlers of all time. We're going to take care of business tonight, and that's the bottom line. And now he's dominating the world of on-demand audio. And he's doing it for the working man. This is a damn good outlet for me to spew the bullshit off my brain. This is the Steve Austin Show. Unleashed. 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 All right, everybody, welcome to Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the main streets of Los Angeles, California today on Thursday's Unleashed Show. I continue my conversation with the Broken Skull Challenge returning champion, elite obstacle course racer, Spartan race badass, Hunter McIntyre. Get a chance to catch up. Part two of my conversation with him. We go a little bit into the, uh, man, you know, it's on the Unleashed podcast, so we start cussing up a little bit in this one. And uh, some great stories delivered by Hunter in this uh, episode of the Steve Austin Show. And goddamn, what a life this young man has lived. But before we get to Hunter, shit, the remodel continues over here at 316 Gimmick Street. Son of a bitch. We just got our countertops down, and they just put the island in. It's made out of quartzite or some kind of shit like that. Kristen, how are you? <laughs> it's so funny when you ask me how I'm doing. Well, we just got finished eating lunch together, but I don't know how you're doing right now. I'm doing great, Steve. Okay, so what the fuck? Is quartzite a granite or is it marble? What is it? It's a stone. It's a stone. It's a big flat stone. Big enough to make an, uh, a, a, an island in the middle of your kitchen on. Well, it's flat now. They had to carve it out of a... Big Mountain mountain. somewhere, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, Jesus Christ, that part of the uh, remodel is done. But that's, they, the, that's the last part we want to remodel, too. I know. <laughs> it's the first we part a done. A lot of work we get, uh, still done. Our ETA getting back in the house is, I think it's probably been pushed back till about the middle of April. I'm thinking December 2019. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking as soon as I got a couple of interviews going, I got a guy coming by the house uh, tomorrow, a world-class powerlifter coming in, and then uh, I'm going to be talking to uh, Zoltan Bathory of Five Finger Death Punch, and when I get those interviews done, I might get my goddamn Ford Bronco, and I might drive down to the ranch and leave you and the dogs here to oversee the remodel while I go down there and just hang out and just cruise around on my Bronco on the mean streets of the Broken Skull Ranch. There you go. Unless you want to come with me. <laughs> I'd love to come with you, Steve. No, you ain't going to go with me. You want to stay here and do your Zumba. Yeah. So I'm making a solo trip then. <laughs> no, we can all go together. Well, are you ready to go? No. I tell people this all the time. I say, hey, I don't really make plans. I just, all of a sudden, I'll wake up one time and I'll say, tell my wife, you know what? I'm thinking about going to the ranch. And you say, when are you going? I say, eh, maybe Wednesday. How long are you going to be gone? And I'll say, I don't know, seven or ten days. And that's what happens. So I'm giving you a heads up right now. In a couple of days, I'm going to drive down to the ranch. A couple of days? It's not even March. I know it's not March. But, I mean, I'm tired and, you know, I'm kind of cooped up here in this run of house. <laughs> banging and beating the shit out of 316, putting in all the new shit. And I just got to get out of here. Well, the shed hunting's not going to really start that soon. She's talking about shed hunting. The antlers fall off the deer's heads, and man, we uh, it was like Easter last time we yeah. went. Most time we get down there, Ted will be down there. My brother went down there last time and found everything in front of us, but we hit it right in the sweet spot. We found everything. Yeah. And there's a couple of goddamn big-ass bucks that I want to find the sheds to. Well, yeah, we found two sets last year, which is very rare. Matching sets. Yeah, matching sets. And they were sitting there right beside each other. Right beside, happens. yeah. And let me see. It's real. It's been real green. There's been a lot of rain. The grass will be tall. You gotta have snake boots. You gotta look out for snakes. Oh wait, you're telling me about snake boots? Oh yeah, <laughs> because I always wear flip flops out there. It drives my wife crazy. She brought me a new set of snake boots for my birthday. Thank you, honey. I ain't even broke them in yet. I ain't worn them one, one time. Well, you get to wear them now. Yeah. Uh, so in your decision. You can come down to ranch with me, or you can stay here. I'll probably go in about a week. I'll. But let's talk about it here and now. Shit, we had a couple of exciting days happen. What do you got on the list? Oh, yeah, let's talk about the new rug. So <laughs> we're renting this house over here. We're renting a house right next door to 316 Gimmick Street. And it's a three-bedroom house with one bathroom. And I've used one of the bedrooms to do my podcast in. And when I do a podcast in there, I've got one of the chairs, which was part of our furniture set in the living room at 316. It's a big-ass chair. And I'm sitting in a chair 
and I got my laptop computer on a little square ottoman Kristen bought on Amazon for nineteen ninety nine. dollars <laughs> For I got, myself, and I've never used it. <laughs> I, I, I use it all the time when watching the season three of Breaking Bad. And I got my uh, Blue Yeti or my Yeti, whatever you call a microphone, sitting on a two-foot step ladder. You talk about a <laughs> shitty system. <laughs> so, you know, at least I was in there the other day. I was talking with Hunter McIntyre, and I turned the table. This is my normal podcasting table from, from next door. And I it's turned, now our dining room table. It's now our dining room table at this house. And I turned it on its side, and I barely fit the legs through there, and I dragged a couple of chairs in there so that when Hunter came over, you know, I had somewhat of a setup. But it's a little bouncy in there. Well, and it's a very small room. Yeah, it is a small room. And it's bouncy because of the hardwood floors, the, the walls. The and we don't have anything on the walls. So. Nothing in there. So I said, okay, we got to go to Home Depot and buy a goddamn rug. So that rug will kill some of the bounce in there. I was wondering why you and Hunter were wearing blankets the other day when I came in. <laughs> I had blankets scattered everywhere. I put uh, I put my camouflage jacket in there. I put some pillows on the ground. And that's why I was trying. This is an award-winning show. It ain't never won shit, but I'm trying. So I was trying to, you know, have a little quality. So anyway, back to the the task at hand, which was I told you, let's go to Home Depot and buy a rug. An area rug, yeah. And so I was in there with my tape measure, and I wanted a rug. It was about seven feet by nine feet. So we go to Home Depot. All they have are eight by ten, five by seven. <laughs> eight by ten and five by seven. A five by seven just ain't quite big enough, and an eight by ten is just a little much. What I wanted was a seven by eight or a seven by nine. So we're inside Home Depot, and I had already bought some indoor-outdoor uh, carpet to go Artificial. outside the door uh, here. What's that? Artificial grass. Yeah, indoor-outdoor carpet. That's like that artificial turf-looking stuff that you... That's indoor-outdoor carpet. It is? Yeah, whatever you want to call it. But we got to put that in the backyard because it's so muddy back there because there's so much trees around here that the sun didn't get down there. And as much as it's been raining in California, the dogs track in so much mud... That's the kind of turf that you play bunch of golf on. It's in our backyard. <laughs> I jerry-rigged it. I cut it with my pocket knife to fit out there, and that's what the dogs wipe their feet on now. So I'm already walking around with my basket with that son bitch in there, and we go over to the rugs. Wait, let's take a step back. You need to wipe your feet on that thing. We'll get to that story in a minute. <laughs> so back to the rugs. I don't know how much money we're spending on this remodel next door because my wife is writing the checks and I haven't asked her. <laughs> but when they tore out, it's a two-and-a-half bathroom house, and they tore out everything in the bathrooms, and they tore out half the kitchen and all the closets, and we're putting in hardwood floors, and they're skim-coating the walls. I mean, it adds up. So we're spending some money on this remodel. My point is, back to the story, I'm trying to get an area rug to control the sound quality on my podcast, and I'm over looking at a rug that cost about $169 to $199, and my wife is resolute in saying, <laughs> that's too much money. That's too high. God damn, Kristen, this is, this is number, number one podcast in the world, and you're talking about prohibiting me from spending a hundred and ninety nine dollars on a fucking area rug yeah it's wasteful. work with me here well you did a good thing okay so there i was <laughs> i said all right my wife is right let me try to find a more cost well besides rug. the fact that all the area rugs were really hideous they were they don't make a, a an area rug that's kind of good looking or it'll pass they either god awful ugly and a buck 99 <laughs> or really pretty and close to a thousand dollars now i ain't spending a thousand dollars on a rug that ain't gonna happen 200 <laughs> yeah but they look like shit so anyway i couldn't find the right size rug my wife didn't want me to spend that much money and i go over there and i see this little gray carpet it's not the size I want, but it's like twenty eight dollars. No, it's eighteen. It's eighteen dollars. Yeah. Okay, so it's eighteen dollars and I told my wife, I called her on the phone. I said, I'm over here on the carpet, I'll come back. You gotta see what I found. And I found a little bitty piece of shit, gray rug. It's about <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's not even eighth inch thick. And I put it on I brought it. My wife says, Oh yeah, I'm a big hero since it's eighteen dollars. Well, and I was gonna get a um 
you know, one of those things you put under under mat. The, yeah, it sticks the, it to the uh, hardwood floor. Yeah, but those were thirty-two dollars. I'm like, I'm not going to spend thirty-two dollars on something to put underneath an eighteen-dollar <laughs> carpet. So, so I put that little <laughs> son of a bitch on the damn floor, and all of a sudden, Moolah comes hauling <laughs> ass in there, and damn near did a damn wipeout because <laughs> somebody just slips all over the floor. And then I forgot about the damn rug. I come hauling ass in there for some reason. I was only walking quickly, and I almost busted my ass on that cocksucker. And size. I did the same thing. You did too. Yeah. I told I told Chris. I said I'm throwing that motherfucker away. <laughs> And she says, I can return it. I got the receipt. No, I don't think you got the receipt. Yes, I, I saved the receipt. You, I saw you crumpled it up, and you put it in the bag, and I picked it up. No, you put it in the cart. Yeah. And before we got rid of the car, I said, is this the receipt? And you said, yes. I said, I'll take that. And see, my mindset right then was, <laughs> hey, I got the indoor-outdoor carpet, artificial turf, whatever the fuck you want to call it, for the back parts. So the dogs can wipe their feet off when it's muddy. And I got my carpet, so we ain't going to be returning nothing. So, you know, that's a guy's thing. You always throw your receipts away because you don't give a fuck. And I, I ain't going to return nothing anyway. I return everything. My wife will return something <laughs> that costs 20 cents. I that's will. That's what she does. That's the truth. <laughs> we use coupons, and we will return, or she will return. <laughs> So anyway, so you can return that some bitch, and, and uh, we just uh, made a pact that as soon as I get finished recording the open of this show and the commercials and the clothes, we're going to Home Goods to get a goddamn rug. Because they have nice ones there, and they're pretty inexpensive. Yeah, but we got to do something. Yeah. Because I mean, I got to have a little sound control in there, and it's too bouncy, and there's just there's no atmosphere in there. And the other problem is, I need a damn table because turning this thing on its edge, it's only a um, a forty by forty table. But when you turn it on its edge and move it through there, you scrape the paint off the damn sides of the wall. The table barely gets through there, and it's it's a clusterfuck. It's not professional. Well, and you have to keep transporting a dining room table from room to room. I know. I'm trying to get a little atmosphere in there so I can stoke up some creative juices as well. It's just, it just really sucks ass, so I need some help here, Kristen. We'll, we'll, we're on it. Well, I told <laughs> after you. Return, after I return the rug. Okay, we're going on good. <laughs> hey, but I, t I told you guys that we were watching Breaking Bad again. We decided it's our favorite TV show of all time, or one of them, so we wanted to rewatch it again. And, man, we're noticing things this time around that we didn't notice the first time and around. And that we forgot about. Too. And that we completely forgot yeah. about. And so the other night we were watching Breaking Bad, and I had to push the pause button. At 9 o'clock at night. 9 o'clock at night. We're winding down. We're about to go to sleep. And I hit the pause button because the dogs needed to go to the bathroom. And since the dogs were going to go to the bathroom, I figured I'd go out there with the scoop and the rake and pick up the dog shit. So since it was dark, I had on my cap, my baseball cap, with a lantern on it with a flashlight. And I was out there picking up the dog shit, and I'm thinking, boy, my wife is really going to be proud of me now <laughs> because that's what I get told all the time. Every single day, did you pick up the dog poop? Did you pick up the dog poops? Or have, how much poop was there? That's, my wife is obsessed with the dog shit. She calls it poop. I call it shit. I call it poo. Poo. Okay, whatever. <laughs> I went out to go scoop up all that dog shit, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm really doing good here. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left on this episode. I'll go in a hero. We'll kick back. I'll put my feet on the ottoman, and we'll finish watching Breaking Bad. All of a sudden, I do everything that I just told you I was going to do. I come in. I wipe my... I've got flip-flops on. I wipe my flip-flops on the carpet with a lot of force just to make sure that there's no mud or grass or anything because it's been so rainy out here. Hell, I walk in proud as a peacock, <laughs> sit on the couch, prop my feet up on the ottoman, $19.99 from Amazon, this little cubicle that my wife put together, which I didn't think was going to be worth a fuck, but I used the hell out of it. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we're sitting there. I hit the play button on the gimmick for uh, Netflix, and then all of a sudden, my wife goes, I smell dog shit. You didn't say poop on us when you didn't say poo. You go, I smell dog shit. <laughs> And I was like, I don't, because I would wiped my feet. I knew that it wasn't me. And I started, I'm thinking, God damn, what the <laughs> fuck? And she goes, Steve, it's all over the bottom of your flip-flop. It was disgusting. I mean, it wasn't just a little bit of shit. And it was Hershey's shit, because I can tell the difference of uh, who shits, Moolah or Hershey. And it's Hershey's shit. And Hershey, when she takes a dump... 
She'll hunch up like a dog does, and sometimes she'll walk about 40 yards like that as she continues to drop nuggets out of her ass. <laughs> and so while I'm thinking I'm on a, a particular pile of them, I'm thinking I'm avoiding the, uh, the rest of the little landmines she set for me. I can see these big clumps where a mula went, and I'm scooping those up. All the while, I probably stepped in about three piles of Hershey <laughs> shits. Because it do- covered I- almost 90% of the bottom of your shoe. God damn it. <laughs> I, I put the uh, the scoop and the rake over there by the storage unit. I come back in the house, wipe my feet off, sit down just like I just told you. All of a sudden, my wife smells that dog shit, and I'm like, God damn. I look at the bottom of that flip-flop, and, of course, when I put my feet up on an ottoman, <laughs> I just I put dog. I mean, this is one of those things like uh, you know, sometimes when you see a baby and they spray, yeah. they, they wipe shit <laughs> everywhere. You couldn't have tried to come in with dog shit on the bottom of your feet and spread it more than I did after I tried to be so cautious and to get that hero badge. So I hit the damn pause button again, take my flip-flops, put them on a back step, and just get a paper towel and start wiping up stuff everywhere. My wife gets the damn mop. She's mopping the floor. I got the bleach. I'm bleaching everything. <laughs> and then she says, get the vacuum cleaner. Like, get the vacuum cleaner. She goes, get the vacuum cleaner. And when she says, get the vacuum cleaner, like she told me to get the vacuum cleaner, I got the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> After spreading dog shit all over the house, which we had just cleaned up that very day, I figured I ain't going to fuck with her. I'll get the vacuum cleaner. It's a good idea, honey. But so the I, funny part is trying to watch you operate the vacuum cleaner because <laughs> you don't this. know all the buttons are. <laughs> Shit, we got this newfangled vacuum cleaner about six months ago. And, man, I've been working my whole life, but I ain't run a whole lot of vacuum cleaners. I just work them upright kind that you yeah. just push this the little canister. release button on. Yeah, it's a canister kind. So I didn't know how to work a fucking vacuum cleaner. <laughs> so after spreading shit all over the house like a moron, now I can't uh, operate the vacuum cleaner like an idiot. <laughs> So my wife comes over here, shows me how to watch, watch, use the uh, vacuum cleaner, and we proceed to spend 30 to 40 minutes cleaning up <laughs> dog shit. Now, bear in mind, when you clean up dog shit like a guy style, like I would have done it, hell, I'd have been done in five minutes. <laughs> but when my wife brings her scientific germ-free approach into it, <laughs> it's a different ball game altogether. <laughs> Because guys clean up shit a whole lot different than their wives, especially my <laughs> wife. What's up with all the damn cleaning? You didn't think I had it done good enough? No, it was still. I could. I could still smell it everywhere, and it I gets mean, you're stuck. You're like a damn bloodhound. That nose of yours. <laughs> holy smokes! I mean, you can smell a goddamn anything. You, you should be a drug sniffing person. <laughs> Put me on a leash. Take me to the airport. <laughs> Anyway, we cleaned up all the dog shit, and I was like, Jesus Christ, man, I'm about to hit the play button on Breaking Bad. And it was right in the middle of a climax of a hell of an episode of season three. And me and my wife looked at each other and was like, really? Well, I said, I need another show to de- I need another episode to decompress after cleaning up all the dog shit. <laughs> so we were traumatized. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I still got my flip-flops. Oh, and then a friend of ours came over and told us, she said, well, I, I used to just use an extra pair of uh, shoes to go clean up my dog poop in the backyard. And I was thinking, God damn, what a novel idea. Why didn't I think of that? So when I go down to the Broken Skull Ranch in seven to ten days, I'm going to bring back my fucking black rubber boots that I hunt in every single day. Since I'm not down at the ranch, I'm right back here. I'm in California. It's raining cats and dogs every fucking day. <laughs> fucking Northern California, the Oroville Dam's about to bust. My dogs are tracking in mud and dog shit. Every time the dogs come in the house, we've got a towel waiting for them, and we wipe their paws off. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm bringing back my black mud boots, and I'm going to put those motherfuckers on every time I go pick up dog shit, Good. and I'm never going to have this problem again. <laughs> Son of a bitch. What else you got written down on that list as far as stories of bullshit that we've been through? Oh, well, we got locked out of the house yesterday. <laughs> oh, man. I told you guys, always have an extra key outside your crib, and many of you have done so. And right next door at 316 Gimmick Street, we still have a safety key hidden somewhere on the property. Well, that key over there hidden on that property ain't doing a goddamn thing to help us into 317 Gimmick Street. My wife and I just came home, opened the doors, and this door over here at 317 Gimmick Street closes automatically by itself, just the way it sits on the hinges. So we come home, we take a load of shit in the house, we go back out to the SUV to get some more stuff. 
Hershey the Wonder Dog comes out with us in the driveway. Moolah stays inside. All the car keys have been transported in here to this table that I'm sitting at right now with my wife. And the door shuts. And so I grab the door handle and go to get in the house. And guess what? Well, no, that's not exactly how it went down. Well, how the fuck did it go down? Because <laughs> that's what I remember. <laughs> it must be a blur to you because we were tra- bringing in all the groceries and all the stuff from Home Depot yesterday. And Hershey escaped through the front door to go to the front to go outside. So I didn't want her going in the street. So I ran out. I said, Steve, the dogs have gotten out. So you chase after me. I chased after Hershey. The door slams. And then we come back to open the door, and it's locked. So you and I and Hershey were locked outside. We didn't know Mula was in here, but luckily we spotted her. And so she couldn't possibly open the door. And, yeah, and I had to get to a funeral. I was getting running late. I had to get into the house. I was going to bust the door down, but you came up with a plan. Well, it's a, the, <laughs> at the end of the day, I was close in respects to how it all happened. The bottom line is we're locked out of the damn crib, and we ain't got no extra key. I mean, this son of a bitch, these windows in this house are old. I mean, I was thinking if I was a thief, how would I get in here? Why well, there's so many windows, it'd be easy to break one of these son of bitches and get in and steal everything in here. An alarm system. Well, there is, but we don't use it. There ain't no camera system. I guess we have cameras. I brought the cameras over. Well, yeah, but they ain't monitoring nothing. And so as far as getting in, we're fucked. Yeah. But I had remembered after I walked around the house a couple of times, like, God damn, we are fucked. My wife's going to be late to the funeral. And that's disrespectful to the person yeah. that had just <laughs> passed away, with all due respect to the person yeah. that passed away. So I was like, you run in late, screech your tires. I'm here for the funeral. I'm here for the funeral. <laughs> And so I'm thinking, I ain't got nothing to do. I just want to do some research for a couple of my guests. And you, you can't politely walk in late to a funeral. There's no way to do it. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> God damn, Kristen made it. Uh, so I, I remember I'd been washing my uh, hands at the sink that day. I just got finished cooking breakfast. And this kitchen in this house is so small, it heated up a kitchen. So I said, man, let me open this fucking window right here. And there was the way in. The fact that I had left that window open. And all of a sudden, I had my six-foot stepladder over here already on the side of the house because I've been working on the gutters over here because they're clogged up. And so my ladder was already back here, and I said, Kristen, I said, I can remove that screen off that window. One of us going to have to crawl through there to the kitchen sink and get in. And, of course, we looked over there after I popped that screen off, and there wasn't no way it was going to be me climbing through that window because I'd have tore out the faucet. We'd have had to enlarge the window. We didn't need a a a crowbar and some KY jelly to get my ass through there. So my wife climbs up the stepladder, climbs through the window, and when she's climbing through the window, I'm snapping pictures of her behind her back, and she don't know what I'm doing until afterwards. So she goes in through the kitchen sink. Go ahead and tell her, have you, have you, go ahead and take us through your breaking and, and entering process. Well, I had to, my back was hurting me, so I had to be super careful because I was having some nerve issues in my lower back, and I'm trying to cautiously and carefully get through that window, and in to the window, my feet go into the middle of the sink. So then I'm sitting at the windowsill with my feet in the sink trying to figure out how am I going to get to the floor. And I just kind of did a, like a tuck and roll almost and catapulted myself onto the floor and I was just happy to be in the house and Mula's looking at me like what in the hell is going on <laughs> Mula's like why are you breaking into the house <laughs> through the window sink <laughs> let me ask you a question would you please stop doing those one-legged bent over whatever deadlifts those are the root where well, you're you got a bad lower back to begin with you got to stop aggravating that thing by doing that cockamamie exercise yes, sir. you insist on doing. <laughs> I told you all you need to do is the compound movements, incline, bench, squat. Do a regular deadlift. You don't need to do the one-legged kind where okay, your leg I, comes over. All right, I'll stop doing it. Yeah, because it was, it was misery trying to watch you go to sleep the other night. I know, night. it was pretty bad. And then watching you go through that window. <laughs> I'm actually going to uh, post the picture of my oh, wife no. going through the window tomorrow when the podcast comes out. <laughs> so you'll see how uh, stealthily <laughs> she got through the window to let us into our own house. Well, Thank you for your act of bravery, Kristen. Please put a key somewhere. I am going to put a key somewhere. We've got plenty of the damn things. We've got yeah. a bunch of extra keys made. Yeah, yeah we, we did. We just ain't got an extra one uh, out there in the yard. Right. So I'm going to do it. I'm on it. 
All right. I appreciate you helping me on the open. You're welcome. I have to go next door. Randy needs my attention. Oh, that means there's another <laughs> fuck up at 316 Gibbons <laughs> yes. Street. Super. Let me know how it goes out. I will. Probably another three weeks behind. <laughs> yeah. I'll catch you down the road. Mm, bye. Thanks for joining me, Kristen. I'll see you in 10 minutes when you get back. <laughs> Let me unplug our microphone real quick. All right. Like I said... I got Hunter McIntyre on the show today. Goddamn what an open that was. Uh, the, the bullshit that we go through. I'm fixing to go get me a goddamn rug over at Home Good, wherever to get it. I don't give a shit where I get it, but I'm going to get a goddamn rug. I got to get a table for in there. Uh, this is just uh, unprofessional and bullshit. So, But anyway, enough about all my bullshit. Let's take care of uh, something important. Let's take care of your snacking habits and get you a solution that's better for your fitness and health plan. And that snacking solution is naturebox.com. Naturebox makes snacks that actually taste great and are better for you. They're made with high-quality ingredients that don't have any artificial flavors or sweeteners or colors. They're made with high-quality ingredients that don't have any artificial colors, flavors, or sweeteners. And they got something for everyone. They got snacks like vanilla bean wafers and Big Island pineapple. And Nature Box recently improved their service. Now you can order as much as you want, as often as you want, with no minimum purchase required, and you can cancel any time. So go to naturebox.com slash Austin and check out their snack catalog. There's over 100 snacks to choose from, and they're always adding new snacks, too. Just choose the ones you like, and they'll deliver them right to your door. And if you ever try a snack that you don't like, Nature Box will replace it for free. And right now, you'll save even more. Nature Box is offering 50% off your first order when you go to naturebox.com slash Austin. That's naturebox.com slash Austin for 50% off your first order. Naturebox.com slash Austin. Everybody knows that February is the shortest month of the year. But at Podcast One, we aren't taking any breaks. We've got a boatload of new shows coming your way this month. Like two from Forbes, Under 30, and The List. Or Postmortem with Mick Garris. And Clipcast, the official unofficial podcast of the L.A. Clippers. But we're not done. Still to come this month, The Raven Effect from Pro Wrestler Raven. A little bit of Growing the Dynasty with Jeff and Jessica Robertson. Plus, in upcoming weeks, shows from Kim Zolchak, Dina Tori Spelling, The Retronauts, and many more. To get more details, go to podcastone.com now. Podcast O-N-E. Steve Austin Unleashed. Unleashed. All right, let's get rolling with Hunter McIntyre. What about your running coach? You still work with him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can see, uh, like, I'll post some stuff online. He puts me in a machine where it's like an anti gravity machine. It keeps you suspended so you can't fall, you can't make any mistakes, but you can push yourself to the utmost limit possible that your body physically allows you. So I'm running 24 miles an hour sometimes when I'm on this treadmill. I could never do that. I was watching that guy. You're in like a suspension harness if you tripped. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Richard Diaz. Rich Diaz, dude, mastermind. I tell you, the greatest story I tell anybody about this guy is he took a kid with autism who could barely walk a straight line, and within a year he made the kid run a 430 mile. Jesus. So, I mean, he's a, he's a genius, and I respect that, and, I, and I, I'm a big believer in putting your money towards things that will make you your personal best because – I mean, that, to me, is my business, but in anything, if it's like your education, do the same exact thing. Dedicate yourself. Find the best. How many times, I mean, because I got on YouTube, and I watch you, you're in, a, uh, in the harness, and you get this, um, like a bungee cord. It's yeah. An elastic, something, something, wasn't it, like a chain, but you yeah. pull him, he's on a bicycle, and, man, all of a sudden, you guys are going up a hill. And he's, <laughs> you know, he, he's motivating you. He's yeah. telling you where you're at, what you got to do, push Oh, man, he, he cracks the whip. Yeah. Yeah. So, man, I, when I started breaking down, you know, we, we'll segue here in a little bit to Broken Skull Challenge. When I start breaking down, okay, well, I mean, I'm kind of putting two and two together, how Hunter was able to do all the things he did out here. Yeah. You've been, you've been training like a beast for Jesus Christ, how long now? Uh, specifically. Specifically for this sport, I would say since 2013, you know, 20 hours a week minimum. And um, as I said before, anybody who's like looking to kind of get involved with, you know, obstacle course racing, Broken Skull Challenge, that's what it takes, man. And I'm sure you were at the same point when you were in your career, man. You knew what it took to be in the gym every single day to look the way you wanted to be and to perform the way you wanted to be. And anybody who wanted to take your crown, they're going to have to work past that or they're going to have to be smarter at it. So to me, um, every single day is an opportunity for me. So I, I, I find the best coach. I find the best training partner. I find the best food. And then I, you know, I take the smoothest, least path of resistance, basically. Okay, so you got all these different plans from the weightlifting to the, uh, the running coach. Yep. Uh, so, so who's overseeing everything? Oh, uh, yeah, I was, I was going back to the Super Bowl. Yep. Bill Belichick, the head coach. Oh, you got defense coordinator, offense coordinator, you know, special teams, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, but he's the one overseeing it all. Who's the guy that – or are you the guy? That I am the guy at the moment. And uh, sometimes I wonder if that's a good idea or not. In reality, 
I'm such a creature and uh, who loves to just obtain knowledge and work with specialists in all different ways. Sometimes I'll work with a coach for three months, six months, and then I'll move on to the next guy. Not because I don't respect what he's doing, but I want to learn more and try new things. But um, I'm starting to think that I'm going to lean a little bit away from that this year and try to hand it off, get a little bit smarter about it. I'm quite excited. There's a strength training coach called Charles Poliquin. He's like the most decorated man in history when it comes to training Olympians and all sports. Um, I'm working with him as a consultant. Hopefully we're getting together in March. So um, like something like that where I hand him the, the blueprint and he just fills it out and he gives it back to me, and I'm just going to follow his plan 100% and stick to it for a year and see what happens. Yeah, I've been reading a lot about his stuff. Well, I have for years, nutrition-based stuff. And yeah, like he's genius. Attention, you know, for uh, hypertrophy. Yeah, tempo muscle. stuff, yeah. Yeah. Genius. So how did you hook up with Ripito? Um, Ripito was something that was unique in its own way. It was just like, you know, I started to read through all these books, and he and I have actually never spoken, but I just started to find people who – really impressed me had somehow been influenced by him. So I just started to become a student of his nature. And, uh, you know, there's a guy now here at Deuce Gym. His name's Jordan Feigenbaum. Uh, you know, I, every once in a while when I see him, I just ask questions, whatever I can get out of him. And um, he worked under him as like his right-hand man for many years. So uh, hopefully one of these days I'll work with Mark. So just uh, before, I want to ask you some stuff about Spartan races. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, but before we do, just as far as like the big three would go from a powerlifting standpoint, I know you like to deadlift, you like to squat. Do yeah. you do any bench? I do bench. We have bro day, which is Wednesday. Wednesday, I forgot to add that in there. Along with cardio, we got to hit the bench and the barbell row and a little bit of these guys. So know? I know you're lifting raw, uh, yeah. I'm assuming. So what's your best squat, bench, and dead? Best squat today uh, to history was 365. That's nothing crazy, but still, I was like, you know, a cardio machine. Dead is 480. That's great. Yeah, it's good for me, good for me, and bench 275 for two. But, um, you know, those things I would like to increase, but at the same time, knowing the nature of my sport, every time that goes up, something else has to give. So um, I'm not I'm not going to be that guy just yet. Dude, I'd like to see the guys you're competing with try those three lefts. Yeah, that's yeah. That's a lot of weight. Yeah, no, no. But that's the thing. Um, the passion for for the iron game, for me, sometimes can be a little bit of a distractor. So I'm looking forward to finding out from someone like Charles, like I was listening to an interview of his just recently, they can get some of their Olympic athletes down to one workout a week. And, you know, that might be heartbreaking for me, but maybe that's all I need. Dude, what would you do in all the spare time? Do you have any hobbies? No, you know what? As I said, I'm a big reader. Um, other than that, hobbies would probably be watching action movies. Swear to God, I'd probably watch one a day. Um, not that I'm just a TV junkie, but... That, that intensity of, like, Jean-Claude Van Damme and all those guys energizes me. So when I go out to train, I'm like, ah. So, um, you know, I don't really have many hobbies. And my friends actually told me I need to find one recently, so that was kind of depressing. What do you but, get music you listen to at all? You know what? Um, when I ride my bike, it can be kind of like the old orchestra-type orchestra stuff, you know, or Johnny Cash. And when I'm writing or reading – it's usually some kind of electronic music, like a trance song, because it's very easy to hone my head in. And other than that, I don't really listen to anything. Man, when I do read, I can't listen to anything. Really? Because I'll find myself either listening to the song, and all of a sudden I'm reading, but I don't pick up any information off the page. Yeah, I had to learn how to basically find things that were like as simple as possible, that were a little bit of distracting, but also white noise so I didn't hear anything else. If I like, if I heard a bird chirp, that's way worse for me than all of a sudden like a like a little bit of a melodic beat type right. thing. Yeah. Spartan racer. Yeah. How many of those things you've been in now? Upwards of fifty, man. You're doing about ten to twenty a year sometimes. Each one's different, right? Hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, they have, they have the bare bones where they're like, you know, you know, you're going to be running, you know, you're going to be doing some climbing, you know, you're going to be doing some carrying, and you know, you're going to have to do some like grit stuff, which is the barbed wire crawl, the you know, the cold water, the gnarly shit. But yeah, each one's a new experience. Do you know the distance going into it? There's parameters. A sprint is three to five miles. Uh, super distance is the eight to ten miles. The beasts or you know the long distance championships uh, are thirteen to sixteen miles, and we have twenty four hour ones as well. But um, I only do that like maybe once a year, once every two years. So how many of those can you compete in in a year? You know, as I've grown older and wiser, I've realized that you can only burn yourself out on so many. You know, the more you spread yourself out, the the less you can give at each one of those things. So I'm um, recognizing about eight is the sweet spot, maybe 10 if I'm crazy. 
So what's the deal with the, the opposite course racers? Like uh, the, the guys that came out, shoot, I guess it was the second to last episode. Yeah. Isaiah. Isaiah Vidal. Uh, Benny. Benny Gifford. Yeah, those guys. Are, are those? Is that all Spartan, or is there a separate OCR? There's so many. cat. Like, I mean, OCR is like an umbrella term. There are so many events okay. going worldwide. I think it is the biggest participation sport, endurance sport worldwide right now. It's out of control. Like, you know, six, seven million people in the United States last year did one. Worldwide, you know, you're looking at probably, you know, almost double that. And, um, you know. But it's bigger over in other countries, right? It's huge. Yeah. Man, the U.K. and all, all across Europe. It's but it's big. gaining ground over here, but it's, it's way bigger overseas. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they definitely, they, they, they have better structure. They've got better TV. Um, participant numbers, I don't know if it's the same because we, we kind of like throw out so many events every single weekend. It's almost out of control. You know, in the in L.A., you probably can find five in one weekend sometimes. Is Spartan the Mac Daddy then? Yeah, Spartan's probably the most developed and most competitive one. Uh, you know, there's other ones that are building their way up. Like in the U.K., there's Toughest, Tough Mudder, which is a uh, has been something that's been notorious for more of like a camaraderie building thing, has just this year made themselves a competitive sport. So we'll see where that goes. Um, in reality, though, like if you want to find the most talented, most like you know drop dead focused badass athletes, you go to a Spartan Championship. What about the death race? You ever did one of those? You know, I stayed away from it because it's the kind of thing where you could show up and they'll say, "Hey, we want you to smash pots and pans on your head for an hour," and then the next hour we want you to take your shoes off. We want you to walk across glass. And I was like, "This isn't really." scratch my back the way some people do right yeah so in reality like that's not necessarily a contest it's more of a character builder and to some people that is that like i've done these kokoro camps these navy seal camps i want to get you that about that because i talked to mark divine yeah yeah that to me was a little bit more understandable but right it's it's these things are very, very tough on your well, body. Well, you know what you're signing up for going to the way you, you do and you don't. Yeah. But you know you're under kind of like a, a SEAL-type environment where yes. it's going to be safe. Yeah. It's going to be ex- extreme, but it's going to be safe. The death race, I have, I don't believe, is is designed to be dangerous. There are some outcomes that may end up putting people in positions. But right. the guy who – Joe DeSena, who founded this whole thing, he has the real reins on those death races. And he knows me well – and he would come after me like a shark after somebody in the water. You know what I mean? Like he would come after me. So I'm petrified of him also. Well, I, I remember talking to uh, Alex, one of the competitors out there at one time, and he was in uh, one of the death races. I think they had him in the back of a pickup truck blindfolded. And I think, and I think they put him in there. There's a bunch of steers or cows or bulls or something like that. But I mean, to me, that's just that's kind of the unknown that I don't want to fuck with. Yeah, no, me, I'm, I'm out. Yeah. yeah. As long as they don't get a race, okay, we might throw a spear. Uh, you know, go through some gravel, yeah. go on some bar bar. I, I could, I could probably handle that if that's what I did. Exactly. But you know, all of a sudden, I take a blindfold off, and I'm looking at a bunch of no, it ain't me. Yeah, no, no. I, I just, I, I can face something if I know what I'm facing. I, the unknown to me right. is a little bit of a creature. Yeah, I can't but there, take. There, there is unknown in the Spartan races for sure. So but... here's a question I got you. Uh, not to ask you all the different unknowns. Yeah. But like when I when I came up in the wrestling business back in the Stone Ages, mm-hmm. dude, we had no medical uh, staff, no trainers, this that or whatever. Yeah. So all of a sudden, man, you guys are on your course, whether it's a short run or a long one. Is there any? You know, you're looking at premier athletes, but anything yeah. can happen. Is there any kind of medical personnel out there to help you guys? No, it's very well orchestrated. I, I, there are when we're really going after. It. We have ATVs and those, um, you know, the the, the what's the, the thing? What's the thing that you drove up? Kawasaki. In? Cow- yeah, that thing's badass. I love those. So there's those following us at all times. Okay. Now everybody between the first man to finish and the last man to finish, they have less, you know, eyes on. But at the same time, it's very well done. Where I don't, no one's ever died. I believe at a Spartan race. One time at a Tough Mudder, someone drowned. But you know, everyone's pretty much well uh, looked after. What is the worst thing that's ever happened to you on a Spartan race? Rolled an ankle and tore a ligament. Just a crappy little annoying injury, I'm sure. You know when you step off a curb and you just go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah basically one of those things, but a little bit more severe. But other than that, man, I'm, I'm pretty good. So what's the deal? You got to carry your water with you? And you, you always, yeah, yeah, no. You're talking about some like peanut butter? Some, oh, yeah, yeah. Just... It, you got to be well-designed out there. Um, you know, I try to stay away from the races where I'll be starving by the end of it type right. thing, but... Um, you know, the worst I'll be facing is I'll stuff like a, a goo or two in my belt line or I have a short that's specifically designed to hold them. And um, the most I'll take is like a bottle of water this big, but I stay lean. I stay ready. You know, don't need too What's much. What's this goo? 
Goo, you know what? Sugar it, carbohydrates. It, it, it's, it's basically probably the worst thing for a human to ingest unless you're doing something like a Spartan race. or you know, I wouldn't suggest anybody eating them. But, uh, yeah, carbohydrates. You know, when you're moving super fast, you know, your body can only – it can burn only one thing to get that energy and that sugar and your body only has a finite store so you just start gulping this thing down you get a little punch you run so um yeah but, you know you can't carry a red bull in my pocket man i gotta talk about brother's called challenge hell yeah how'd you find out about the show are you flipping channels uh no honestly i i had seen it before um my buddy alex had participated and yeah. told me about it and uh, I believe, uh, no, I know for sure, my buddy Scott Keneally, who is um, a big influencer in the sport and he has done documentaries on it, he uh, was connected with somebody who is you know, somehow behind the scenes in your production and said, hey, Hunter, Hunter's a great guy for this thing and somehow you know, pushed me forward. But for a while, you know, for me, I thought to myself, it would be, you know, this is a little bit gimmicky. I'm going to get, like, get myself in a situation where it's like a bear trap. Like, I just, I don't know, I'm going to walk over and all of a sudden I'm going to fall through a hole in the ground. Like, you know, oh, Hunter fell through the hole. Like, I thought it was going to be too gimmicky and I didn't have a chance. But then once I signed up, man, my, you know, my mind was set on it and I was dedicated just like I dedicate to everything else. And um, I came to win, man. And it's been a, it's been a long road since. But as you said, you know. I'm waiting for that person to come get me. What did you think about the challenges? I mean, like, did you did you have any favorite or things that you didn't like? I mean, I know you were in trench warfare. You probably were in drag race. Yeah, drag snatch. race. I mean, there was a whole litany of the things. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of that stuff. I think simplicity is key. I think simplicity and hard work is key, and that's what you got going on in the show. To me, I love doing one thing max effort. And if that means I got to take somebody and drag their ass across the room, that's it. Don't make me jump over fences and, you know, do this, that, and the other thing, bob and weave. I want to just get it done, and I want people to suffer and me to suffer while it happens. So I like something like the drag race or trench warfare is another thing, man. Like seeing two people in such a confined space go head-to-head is so intense. I mean, it's almost more intense than that of MMA, man, because you've only got one thing you can do, and that's to shove that bastard as hard as you can. You can't dance around and bob and weave on punches. So, you know, I love that kind of stuff. And then, you know, as another thing like pile up, I built something in my backyard, and I didn't know pile up was coming. I tied a fire hose around a 200 pound tire, and I drag it up this hill as hard as I could. So when I got a hold of that thing, it was just it was second nature to me. So um, I, I love it, man. I love it. It's raw. What did you think when you first got a chance to uh, look at the Skull Buster? In reality, uh, I think that's what obstacle course racing should be today. I think it should be short. I should. I mean, if it's going to get into the Olympics, which we're talking about now, it needs to have these really intense and wild, you know, tests of of your athleticism. And, you know, right there, you come down, you got that back-breaking thing. I love carrying heavy weight. You know, when you built the dome, something like that right there to me, that took every, you know, it may not look like it on TV, but that takes every bit of focus for me to get through that thing and get through it fast. Like, I love that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, heartbreak kill and those ropes right there, man, you know, that right there is a good combination to really see who's got the guts. And um, it's awesome to see athletes who I, I remember you had a couple seasons back this black guy who looked like probably the fittest thing I've ever seen in my entire life, and he couldn't get up the rope. Yeah, so let's go ahead and take a pause for the calls and help out the sponsors to keep the show on the air for free. So big ups to True Car. If you're in the market for a car, then you need to check out TrueCar.com and the True Car app. True Car gives you the price and information you need to feel confident about your purchase. When you register with True Car, you will see what other people in your local market pay for the car you want. From there, you can connect with a local True Car certified dealer and enjoy a more confident car buying experience. True Car shows you real pricing on actual inventory, so you see competitive pricing offered to you by True Car certified dealers for vehicles that are actually on their lots. True Car makes car buying easy, no matter if you're looking for a brand new or a used vehicle. There's over 500,000 pre-owned vehicles available from True Car certified dealers nationwide, and there are over 13,000 True Car certified dealers. And over 2 million cars have been sold to True Car users by the True Car certified dealer network. True Car users save an average of over $3,000 off MSRP. So when you're ready to buy a new or used car, visit TrueCar.com or download the True Car app to enjoy a better car buying experience. Some features not available in all states. 
Hey, it's Jordan Harbinger. For the last 10 years, I've successfully helped people build their self-confidence with my Art of Charm podcast. And now, along with Art of Charm, I'm hosting a new show. It's Podcast One's latest program, The Forbes List. On the show, we talk to the Forbes editors that curate their famous and respected lists, like self-made richest people, billionaires, and highest paid athletes. We'll get behind-the-scenes insight and information that doesn't make the print cut. It launches this week, on February 16th. So please subscribe on iTunes to the Forbes list, and don't forget to rate us, review, and share. Steve Austin. Steve Austin. Unleashed. Unleashed. So I was sitting there listening to Hunter describe all the activities at the Broken Skull Ranch, and all of a sudden I looked down at my Zoom H4 and recorder, and it said, card full. I said, son of a bitch, I can't believe it. Broke the 411 down to Hunter. Man, we were just talking about the Skull Buster and all kinds of good shit. I uh, know. We, right we, we, really we got in the thick of it. We got in the thick of it. God but, dang uh, it. I'll hey, leave it to you, man, where you want to go with it. Okay, I'll, let's go back to Skull Buster. You talk about some of the elements going into it, but the Beast Mode Skull Buster yeah. was a badass day. And this was many times I got a chance to hang around you. And uh, you know, we talked a little bit here and there, yeah, you know, as much as we could. But man, you know me, I'm, I'm very impartial out there. I show nobody no favoritism. But the longer you're there, you know, you try we, to make we, friendship. We built a friendship. Yeah, yeah, so we had fun out there. And uh, this time out, beast mode, the best of the best, four years of all stars. Yeah. And of course, you're right there in the thick of things because you're my returning champion. Everything to lose. Yeah. And so you came back. And, <laughs> a lot of people following sudden, after me. Dude, you came out there. And before we started, I mean, you were psyching yourself up. And I was just like, okay, is he psyching himself up or is he psyching them out? Because they didn't show this on television because you couldn't. But on the podcast, like Hunter was walking around. and like, motherfucker, come on, come on, fuck you. And he wasn't telling anybody does go fuck himself. He was just doing that, and he was just hyping himself up. And I'm like, man, this guy is really intense. But I thought it was twofold. I, yeah, thought, yeah. I thought, one, I think <laughs> that's that's you. You're an animal. But I thought also you're very cerebral, and I thought that was towards the opposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can break it down for me. I played it out. You know, honestly, I as an athlete need to put myself in that position. i got to recognize that it's go time, and that's a mental switch. And uh, I've done a lot of research on that, you know reading up in the books, but also it's something that just made me really engage in the moment. So I had to psych myself up. But also, you know, you hear about the story about Arnold Schwarzenegger when his competition's hanging out with him. He tries to play a little mental games. And I always recognized that was a big thing. Like, you know, when I'm running cross-country meets, when I was, like, you know, going, I would just be like, yo, man, you look really tired. Some other guys, I'd be like, you know, you look much fitter last race. Like, how you been type thing. So to me, you know, letting people know, when I would go to a Spartan race, I'm jazzed up, I'm on fire, and people think I'm crazy. Well, they see that and they're scared. They know what I got in me. You know, sometimes my bark's a little bit bigger than my bite, but I try to make everyone know that I got something going on. And, uh, you know, that's also the fun of it for me, man, and also the enthusiastics. I'm not somebody who's just going to sit there and, like, let life happen. I want to ride it like a wave. So, yeah. What did you think about the, uh, the the way we pulled that last episode where it was you versus him, you know, Skullbuster versus Skullbuster. Yeah. And, you know, uh, depending on who – uh, got rid of their opponent the fastest in the pit. They got to dictate, you know, who was going to run the course first. Of yeah, course, man. And made short work of his opponent. And all of a sudden, Hunter, you're going to run first. Yeah, well, you know what? Um, I like how this, this show is growing and progressing. I mean, that's, that's how it's just going to happen, man. Keep the entertainment up. Keep everybody on their toes. Also, keep the athletes on their toes. So, I mean, to me right there, Ian – took more chances to make sure that I could go first. I'm sure that was something he was thinking in the back of his head. And to me, you know, I just recognized I was going up against an absolute beast. Christian to this day, if you're listening, man, total badass. I respected you. I was terrified of you. And you know what? I just made sure that I survived it. But um, I'm looking forward to next season, man. When you uh, ran the Skull Buster that second time, we yeah. changed the course around. Made it a little bit faster because we changed the Nutcracker. So it was more just, man, straightforward and not so much of a high incline. Because a lot of people had a hard time with that. You didn't, but it slowed a lot of people down. Yeah. And like I said, hey, man, this is a faster course. What did you think about the second course? Because, I mean, that in the, in the world of Spartan racing, you're a short course guy. Yeah. And that's your specialty. That's you can do love. anything. That's what I love, yeah. So what did you think about having that faster course? You to it? me... I think you're going to be able to find a greater athlete, overall athlete, in that shorter distance. When you start to see people, I think the ultimate course is like, you know, that five to seven minute mark right there. And once you see someone in that area and you get a couple athletes around there, you're going to start to see some real studs show up. But also the way that you designed it is 
we had the same skeleton as usual. You know, it starts with a log, ends with a rope type thing, have the hill. But, you know, putting that big tire in there, man. When I saw that thing, I mean, people don't recognize it, but that tire is 10 times the width of me, and it weighs 1,800 pounds. Like, that was no joke. And you've never... I've never seen anything like that. And Coney and the Barbarian, you see him pushing the pillar in the beginning, so I got an idea. But um, in reality, man, I charged that thing like a bull. You know, I was just like, ah, and I hit it. So, you know, reality, I think what you guys are doing is awesome. And I'm, I think you're making an impression. You know, American Ninja Warriors got its thing, but what you guys are doing is like, you know, we got the big bad course right here, and this is what tests. Yeah, the I don't character. want to sit here and blow smoke up my ass or you know try to sell the show. The show is what it is. Hopefully, yeah. it's around for season five. But the thing about it is, and you touched upon it, because I'm a big fan of Ninja Warrior. Yeah, of I'm course. a big fan of anything that has an athletic endeavor to it or some type of challenge or competition. I'm all about you know man against man, woman against woman. So that's the thing. American Ninja Warrior, a lot of parkour athletes, badass athletes. Freaks, uh, that, man. Uh, Casey Cataranzo came out to the Broken Skull Ranch, and yeah. she just barely got eliminated in the pit. We really wanted to see her on the Skull Buster because she's, she's, uh, she's a machine. But the, the thing about Broken Skull Challenge is you got to make it through three rounds of competition, and the mental aspect of it is, is just as important as the physical part of it because it's like – all of a sudden, you know, you're not competing against a course like Ninja Warrior. You're competing against another human being. Yeah. And this human being is, okay, what are they made of? Who are they? You knew some of these people uh, in, during the season. But mm -hmm. all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's a war of mental toughness. Who wants this more, you or them? And, and that's what I like. And that's what I love about the show. And like you said, it is a very simple format. Yeah. Well, you know, honestly, man, as I said, I don't get that opportunity very often. I don't think many people do, and I think the viewers see that. You know, that is a primal kind of feeling right there when you know you gotta you gotta move somebody so you can move to the next round. And you know, it's kind of like the Hunger Games format, like you know, fight to survive. So I love it. Man, I, I liked uh, the the thing I liked about. It. I, I tell people, you know, my job out there is to just facilitate things, to make sure everybody's got a level playing field, let you know what's happening, and you know, set the tone of the show and let you guys, you know, set the stage for fair competition for you guys to give everything you got. Prior to Broken Skull Challenge, I know you've been to Spartan races and all this other stuff, yeah. hanging around stuff. And, and I, like I tell you, when you guys come out there, hey, it's gonna be a long day. You know, if you need a bathroom break, let me know. If you need some sunblock, let me know. But it's going to be a long-ass day the longer you're around. Yeah. How, how was the filming aspect of it? Because it is true competition through and through, <laughs> but there's a lot of hurry up when you got to go, and there's a lot of waiting when someone else is going or they're doing a stop down for the interviews, and it's a long-ass day. That was the hardest part for me. And uh, I don't know if you ever heard about this, but my nickname on, um, on scene was on site was a box of cats. I had my handler and basically I was as hard to herd as a box of cats, just a bunch of little kittens running around the room because I I'm, I got so much energy and also you guys have very strict rules on interacting with competition. It keeps, you know, this element of surprise. And uh, to me, I can't sit in the room next to somebody I know or I want to know and just sit there in dead silence for hours on end. So, I mean, that was gut wrenching for me, but at the same time, it, it added to the intensity, and that's what you guys designed. So, um, you know what? I look forward to the next season, but at the same time, I still uh, I don't want to sit in silence for all those hours. <laughs> yeah, that's the reality of it. But it's a long ass day. It is, man. I, you have you have to do it for a much longer than I do. You know. Well, it was fun uh, last year on season three because we filmed twenty episodes. Yeah. And so basically, you know, I live out there. I got a badass forty uh, five foot camper with four slides. I got all my meals. I got my mule to ride around. Oh, yeah. I got my, my walking stick. I'll just take off and walk in dark or whatever. I get you my got the barbell and bench out. Yeah. yeah. Got my, uh, my, got my, I got my power rack out there to get my workouts in. So I always tell everybody, for me, it's like a paid vacation. And all of a sudden, man, you're just cruising through this. And each, you know, every other day we're bringing a new group of guys or girls out there. So it's like, it's a paid vacation. But you're, you're seeing the best athletes in the United States of America uh, come out there, and everybody's doing something differently. And when you get a chance to switch them up uh, and watch and see what the next group is going to do, yeah, it just—it's a great job. It's a form of summer camp, man. Okay, summer camp. What's next for you? It ain't summer no more. We're talking right now, and it's February. Yeah. What's right down the road? How long will off season last before you get in the championship season? 
I think everybody needs to be calculated about their off season. Mine will probably kind of trickle into the season start and just to be smart about developing myself. But, um, you know, Spartan race has its championship series. That's kind of has been my life for the past three years. Now it's my fourth season. Um, you know, tough mutter, as I said, there's a couple other events coming up and, uh, also, there's some development on the backside of us potentially making it to uh, Japan for the Olympics. So um, I'm doing a lot of things behind the scenes to make sure that I can have that opportunity, but also training so that when it comes go time, you know, I'm 100%. So uh, right now is that stage of developing what you want to do over the next couple of years, having a lot of foresight and making sure that you're smart about your training and smart about who you do it with and when you do it. So, you know, it's uh, the boring stuff. So what's the first competition? April 22nd is the first championship of Spartan race. You got um, Seattle. So I'll be out there, and it's going to be about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes of redlining. Will that be guns blazing? You'll be going for first place? Oh, yeah. You're not saying you're going to creep into the season and hit on the, the, the rocket boosters. You'll yeah, come yeah. in full-blown trying to win everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, 100%. I will be to the best of my ability at that time, but I think you'll see me really on fire once, um, you know, the end of summer comes around. You're going to start to see some awesome things. Do you think you've peaked yet in mentally or physically or in combination no man i i you see I, room for improvement i think every single year i've been developing i really am a much better person and athlete than i was last year now i can make mistakes and i can regress but at the same time if i'm as engaged as i feel i am right now it's gonna be awesome man all the way up through my 30s 40s you never know the one guy that i read about that was such a competitor that you were gunning for hobie call hobie call man he was a world champion this year at 39 of the most decorated competition in the entirety of the sport. 15, 20,000 people there, first place. So where were you? Where, I ended up coming in that si race? I was in that race, man. I, I blew it. I blew it. Took sixth place, but at the same time, I loved that position. When you say you blew it, and, and how long was the race? Uh, two and a half hours. Oh. Okay, so, so in a race like that, I mean, define blowing it. What did you do wrong? Tactical? I'm, Tactical, tactical error. Um, total idiot. I've been to so many of these races before, and before um, a couple of days before the competition, we have a rules and regulations meeting for athletes and uh, other participants amongst the sports to come sit down and see what's going on. Now, this technically ends up being for a lot of foreigners who are competing and haven't maybe done this before. And I've been to so many of these things. I was like, come on, dude. I'm not going to sit through another one of these meetings and have to bump into a bunch of people and do small talk BS. They changed one of the most fundamental rules in the sport the day before competition, and I had no clue. So we get to in, – in our sport, to show completion and control, at the end of everything, you have to hit a bell. So imagine going over the dome and hitting a bell at the end before you move to the next thing or the cargo net or the nutcracker, blah, blah, blah. You cannot hit it with your feet anymore. Before, it was like, you know, I could swing out, kick it, and keep on going, keep this awesome momentum – to show more control and make it safer for participants, they changed it because they saw risk. I didn't know that. I hit this bell. I'm in third place, and I'm making my move. I knew exactly. I would strategize. Like you know, I put this whole strategy together, and it just unraveled me, man. It was like you know, I was just a ball of yarn on the ground. I was like, oh fuck, my whole world just end. So I battled back. You know, I fell back to like ninth place, and I battled back down to sixth. But um, you know what? I lost my momentum, and I'll be totally honest. I don't know if I would have taken first place, but I would have done a lot better. So, yeah, there was a penalty. Took a lot of time arguing with a lot of officials, but, you know, by that time I had to get back into the game. So uh, back to the drawing board. Did Hobie go to the meeting? Hobie did. A lot of people did, and you know what? This may be just my cocky, ignorant way of looking at things, but I thought I knew everything there was to know. But I guess I was watching an interview, and it was from uh, you maybe in uh, 13 or 14. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking about your competition with Hobie. Hey, man, this guy's one of the best in the world. I'm good yeah. for him, but sometimes I'll call him up and he'll say, hey, man, bring a goo, you know, bring some extra water. You guys might be out there for a couple hours. Yeah. So he give you a heads up. So yeah, you guys yeah. are friends. Yeah, we're friends. So he didn't just say, hey, hey you know, you got to hit those bells with your hands, right? You know what? I, I don't think anybody had, had like, you know, uh, malintent or anything like that, uh, ill intent, you know, trying to make sure that I didn't know about it. I think, you know what, everyone had just heard it and assumed that everybody knew. I was the only person who screwed up. Maybe only one other guy besides myself screwed up big time in the in the upper, you know, upper leagues, but uh it was a it was a soul crusher to have that happen, but it was stupid. I've seen you win at the Broken Skull Challenge. Yeah. And I know you've won a lot obviously in your Spartan race career. You're one of the best in the world. Yeah. Okay, I I know how important winning is for you. Yeah. How are you in suffering defeat? 
Um, I've been somebody who's crawled under a rock before at times, but at the same time, um, I'm a phoenix who rises from the ashes. I've always brought myself out of those positions, and I don't know. I can I can't say that forever. I don't know what's going to happen. But um, I told myself at the end of the season because I had I had like almost a, a, the best season of my entire life, and then I had three really bad races, all championships. And I told myself, you know, fuck it, I'm over this. This is such bull crap. I'm better than this. You know what, Hunter? Grow up. To, go do something else. And then I had to go away and you know go to New Zealand and kind of find myself again. And now I'm back. You know, I know what I want to do. I have it written down on a list. I think about it every time I wake up, every time I go to bed, having conversations with yourself. It's in the back of my head. So, um, I you know if I could give people perspective, you're never going to be better than when you're at your very worst. When you can see you're at the very, 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 very bottom, and you can see how far you actually have to go. That, to me, is where I can gain the most perspective. It's not sitting at the top because you never really grow that far. You, you know, The person who's a few rungs down has a lot of room to move. So to me, I love that growth. I love going through that stages, uh, those stages. So you know, use those times when you're in shitty places and look where you can be or where you have been. How close are you with the guys on the circuit? I know you guys have shared rooms and stuff like that. Yeah, we can be very, very close. But as, as I said before and other people that we know um, – it can be tough, man. You know, somebody who's sitting directly across the table from you is thinking in the back of their head, like, yo, man, so much fun to hang out with Hunter, but I'm going to crush that idiot tomorrow. And I'm thinking at the same time, I'm like, yo, Ryan's looking real stupid right now. He's looking like he's out of shape. I'm going to crush him. And it's hard to kind of, you know, get the momentum of the conversation going because that's all you're thinking about. So uh, in off season right now, it's really fun to go skiing with the guys, invite them over to a house to go surfing for a couple of days. But, um, like, I lived with one of my roommates, this kid, Ryan Kent, who might be on the show next year. He really wants to go after it. And we didn't talk much. I mean, we lived together for three months. And, you know, sitting across the table seemed like the distance between me and China. So it was tough. You mentioned in uh, one of your earlier interviews, talking about your parents seeing you about as bad as you could get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are they thought since you've achieved so much success? Not just so much from a competitive standpoint, but from a personal standpoint. I, I think, in all honesty, my parents couldn't be any happier with what I've done with myself. Uh, you know, my mom for a long time was like, go back to college, go go get it done. And then I think she really grew to understand that this is what put the smile on my face. This is what got me up out of bed in the morning. And also having people like, you know, my mom's a real estate agent. People are coming into the office and, oh, my God, I saw your son on television. You're Mrs. McIntyre. Like, blah, blah, blah. And I think that really allows them to connect with their community and also connect with me. My parents loved coming to my races, but uh, it was a tough time, you know. But I, I think, in all honesty, everybody believed in me. And if it wasn't for my parents vetting me and also dumping to- like, you know, money down the toilet, which it could have been, you know, I, I came back. So um, I thank them every single day. I call my dad every day. I call my mom every day. Do you? Yeah, man. Even if it's five seconds on the phone, just saying hi. What kind of student were you in high school? Awful. I was. I would retain the information, but I also didn't see the value in the, in the information. I didn't. Yeah. You know, well, what are we all doing here? You can't tell me to sit in a room with fifteen of my friends and be quiet, and then write write a book about you know a paper about this lame book. So I, I hated it. But now, like I, I think about going back to college. I would love to go back to college. If I, I knew it didn't pull away from what my main focus was right now, I'd be in school because I love the idea of it. But um, maybe a little bit later down the road. But to me, when I talk to you, or, or from what I've seen you do at the Broken Skull Challenge and, and observing everything, you're a person to me with a high IQ. I don't know whether that translates to books or not. Yeah. But you're, you're no dummy. I, I, I hope not. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying that. Yeah. But you just didn't care about school. No, man. You know, I think everybody's got their purpose in life, and mine was a little bit more outside of the classroom. And, um, you know, I, it was tough for me, and I, this is why I want to go back and help mentor people a little bit. You know, when you are given this format and there's 2,000 kids in that school, you have to streamline those kids through this format, this formula. And anybody who's going against the grain, you know, you're going to either have to wash them out or, you know, stuff them full of pills type thing. I want to find ways to kind of help people out, you know, keep on, I keep on harping on that, but that was me when I was younger. I just, I couldn't fit into that one format and make it easy for me. But now as I've come full circle, I see the purpose of it, but at the same time I could go back and try to be in that same environment. It would be just as hard. 
All right, a big question for you. Yeah. We talked about something on the Broken Skull Challenge. Oh, what's this going to be? Do you mind if I bring this up? No, no, go for it. You asked me a question. Yeah. Talk to me about being a WWE superstar. Dude, I was going to ask you, man. Like, I mean, you could see I got some, I got some opportunity. Um, in reality, as I said to you before, and I will tell everybody, I give everything 110%. And if I know the door is open and I know that I've fully moved past with what I've, I'm, I'm working on right now, and if I can put that behind me and I have another door open, man, I'm, I'm going to be a million miles an hour after it. And I mean that, and I mean that from the, the, the absolute core of me. I'm, I want to go get it. And uh, I love it, man. I look up to people like yourself. I got Macho Man Randy Savage tattooed on my ribs because, you know, whatever wrestling means to certain people, I see that arena and I see those contenders and whatever it may be, what's going on in the ring or what see people see outside of the ring, I love it. And uh, you know what? That may be the next progression. That might be Hunter 2.0. So we'll see. Well, I mean, there's a window on that, though. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally get it, man. You, I'm not going to call you up at 45 years old and be like, Steve, I'm ready. Right. Um, no, 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 I totally get that. But uh, as I said, you know, I think that's something right there where I wouldn't want you to vet me or anybody if you thought that they were only 75% in. So I'm waiting to come to you or whoever else that may be the person who opens that door for me when I'm ready. And uh, I, I thought a lot about it. I've talked to a lot of friends um, you know, and I asked all of them, I was like, what do you guys think? Would like, would you guys back me up if I disappeared for a little while? And like, you know, next thing you see me, I'm in tights and I'm freaking jacked and I'm throwing down. And, you know, when I say that right now, you see me, I'm smiling because I really do believe in that, man. Like, you know, you guys are icons, you know, you, you really set the tone for a lot of people. I look at you guys and I say to myself, I'm going to be that one day. So I mean it, man. Yeah. And I had a good time doing it. And, you know, like uh, you, you dropped out of college after one year. I dropped out after five. Yeah. <laughs> I got 17 hours to get a college degree. So it, it worked out okay. There's a happy ending to the story. Yeah. But I knew you were a fan of the business. There's a, always a story. Sometimes it's a good story, a bad story, but it's entertaining nonetheless about yeah. the story behind a tattoo. How did you get Macho Man Randy Savage tattooed on your rib? Okay, so you know what? Almost every tattoo that I have on me comes to me like, you know, it burns in the back of my head. And when I see myself moving forward and taking on a task, I kind of use that. Now, Macho Man on my ribs right here is a picture of him at the top rope, finger up in the air. And I just imagine in the back of my head, like he's just thinking to himself, he's like, number one, anything below me, I will tear to shreds. And I thought to myself right there, I'm like, I got to keep that mentality. So I just took it and I just threw it up on the ribs, man. And I, 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 you may think I'm kidding, but I remember not too long ago, I was in the gym and I was, I was so down on myself. I was like, motherfucker, you've lost it, man. You're in shit shape, like everything. And my shirt's off and I'm laying on my back and I look in the mirror and I just see it sticking up right there. And I'm like, dude, you are a contender. Like, get the fuck up. And I just started going, and that was the start of my season last year. I swear to God. And, uh, you know, it may be ridiculous, but um, those are some of the things that kind of really keep me tied down to the ground at times. That's a, that's a great moment uh, in seeing that tattoo and yeah. helping it inspire you. But what was the story behind deciding to get it inked? Oh, you know what? Um, was that would, a drunken bender? No, no, I, not I, at all. I know no. you weren't sitting there in a calm, meditative state saying, you know what? After thinking about it for about 12 hours, I'm going to go get Randy Macho Man Savage tattooed on my rib. You know, I just, I would always act and, and, and kind of dance around like Macho Man in front of my friends. And I'd get into his voice and kind of get all creepy-like. And, uh, you know, he'd always been a part of me. But for some reason, when I saw that picture, you know, you go online, you Google random things. I saw that picture. It was like, boom. It just went straight to me. And I think within 24 hours, we had the thing on me. Uh, you know, same thing with a sheriff badge tattoo. It was something I joked about for years. And then like, you know, immediately, like it was, if like I was just stepping into, you know, the arena, I was like, man, it's go time. And I just threw that thing on my chest. And ever since then, man, the sheriff badge has been, you know, it's been a real thing. It's part of me. Same with this one. You know, it, it holds on true. What'd your buddy say when you got the Macho Man tattooed on you? They rib you? No pun intended. No, no, no. You know what? I actually went with my best friend, Jesse, and uh, he got an absolutely ridiculous, the dumbest tattoo I've ever seen. So he had no opportunity. <laughs> I've seen some dumb ones. What is it? <laughs> He's got like an eagle tattooed under his armpit with lightning bolts coming out. I'm like, one, you have to shave your armpit for the rest of your life to <laughs> see that ugly thing. And two, I'm like, 
like, oh, man. Like, I even split the cost of it with him because he was dead broke at the time. I was like, I'll get you whatever tattoo you want, but you're going to regret that. <laughs> Did y'all get these done in Connecticut or Cali? No, this was in California right over here. Um, you know the barber uh, the barber shop slash tattoo shop right in um, at Windward Circle? Yeah. Yeah, that one's great. I can't remember the name of it right now, man, but that is, that's my tattoo shop. Yeah, I've gotten two tattoos there. So, yeah, go get one if you guys want to get any more ink. I think it has to be the, you know, it has to be that thing where I, you know, the next stage in my life or at the right time, it's going to tell me when, you know? So, uh, you know, maybe when I get ready to go for the ringside, dude, you'll be knowing. Here's the thing. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe you're like this. It, it, it sounds like you're kind of, we have a lot of things in common. You're a much better athlete. But, like, for me, like, I might wake up, like, in five days, and I'll tell my, I'll tell Kristen, you just met her. Yeah. I'll tell Kristen, I'll say, you know what? Then we'll go to ranch. Oh, when are you leaving? Uh, Tuesday. How long are you going to stay? Eh, seven, ten days. I'll know when I get there. Yeah. And then, you know, Tuesday I'm out, drive to the ranch, get there on the second day, stay for seven, ten days, come back. And then, like right now, as far as my life goes, I wing it. Yeah. Are yeah. you like that? I mean, I, I, mean, I just feel like my brother will tell you where he's going in two years for vacation, what they're going to do when they get there, how they're going to get there, all that other bullshit. Not me. I fly by the no, seat life, Life's spontaneous, man, and I, I definitely recognize that, and I see that in you, and I, I, I'm the same exact way. I'm a big fan of road trips all the time. I just get up and go and do drive to Big Sur, go check out the waves for a second. But, um, yeah, that's what I think the beauty of life is, man. I, I don't want to make things too serious, and – I actually just started dating an awesome girl, and she's been pretty cool about it. Usually, I end up getting losing my girlfriends because I am too spontaneous. But uh, I think I found a good one with this one, and you know that's the reality, man. I, I think as long as I can keep that energy about me, I think that's when I'm going to stay happy, and and that's what's going to keep what many people consider a job to them. Uh, for me, is just playtime, and that's the beauty of my life, man. And um, you know, I hope I can keep it about me. But just uh, before we wrap up, just speak to me about, you know, just the sponsorships with, with how you're able to structure your training yeah. and not work a nine-to-five. Well, you know what? Um, I don't need numbers. The, the sport has grown enough to be lucrative, and I'll, be, I'll give you reality, dude. Like, one of the last championships, there was $100,000 on the line, split between two people, but fifty k is still, like, a good-paying paycheck for most people for their entire year. Now you got another half a dozen events that are – about half the size of that and you know sponsorships you know you get called up by Under Armour you get yeah. called up by Reebok Nike and you know these guys are willing to vet you and I've worked really really hard but also at the same time like look I I'm very very fortunate I contended in your show and I was able to afford that and that's created also another buffer and there's tons of shows out like American Ninja Warrior Spartan Ultimate Team Challenge there's money out there for those go-getters, you know. I think about it all the time. Fuck, I wish I was Tom Brady, man. Like, you know, if I just had thrown a football from the day I started, you guys and I would all be laughing right now. Like, we're, we're eating an In-N-Out burger. We should be at, you know, Boa Steakhouse, you know. But uh, we live a sweet life, man. It's good. I'm glad for that. Hey, let's talk about the Super Bowl for a second. Who are you cheering for? Oh, man, I'm a fan of Tom Brady just because somebody who dedicates – I see him as somebody I look up to, not because of you know his personal life, who he's dating, whatever the heck's going on. He's just channeled, man. To see somebody, like he got MVP and all my friends are talking shit. He doesn't deserve it. He's a pretty boy. He already won his fifth ring. He set a record, man, 460-something yards of passing, and he did it from the third all the way out into overtime like so quickly. like You can't deny it, and that, to me, fascinates me. You know, I don't necessarily believe in the Patriots because of the Patriots. I'm not somebody who wears their sweater around, but I believe in champions, so that's why I picked him. I mean, I just came. I, I'm a big fan of his because I mean, drafted like I think 199th, whatever it was. And oh, then, dude, know, I look at pictures Bledsoe. of him. Yeah, he's playing yeah. behind Bledsoe. Bledsoe goes down with an injury. The kid comes in, bam. Okay, so they start winning. Okay, Belichick happens to be the head coach. They're yeah. a great one-two combination. It's the Patriots system. It's the Belichick way. Uh, but Tom Brady, to go back to your point, he always put the work in. Yeah. And he continues to. He's 39 years old. He had a lights-out year. And it's like some people say, ah, man, I like Brady's pretty boy. Yeah. I, I like the Patriots. They always win too much. God dang. You can't deny How it, How can man. you hate a winner? I mean, people say, okay, Spygate, Deflategate, this gate, stealing signs, what? Hey, man, everybody's looking for an edge, and the Deflategate was bullshit anyway. Whatever. I, Nobody I, wins because there's a couple pounds of pressure out of a football. Dude, it was like someone said on TV the other day. They could have been playing with pillows, and they were still warm. Yeah, yeah. But I just I appreciate how hard the sum bitch works. Well, they did that to me. It. Yeah, that to me, above all else, it could be any sport across the board. doesn't matter who you are. 
a contender or somebody I respect. So, you know, I saw that in him, and I want him to have his fifth ring. Now he should just drop out he, before he loses his brain, gets hit too many times. Man, that's an interesting way to look at it because I think the cats. He said he wants to play till his mid forties, but like uh, yeah. a couple other guys sent him on uh, little messages on Twitter. Hey, man, you got your fifth one? Tap out. Dude, that's I the don't thing, think he's going to do it though. He found the sweet spot. You know what? You remember? Uh, I don't know if this is a good example, but if you think about Lance Armstrong, man, he had all those titles, and then he came back. He got greedy, and then he got in all this other legal trouble. But even if he didn't get in the legal trouble, man, he just started to drop off. Right. You know, he had enough. He had done it all. Then you get greedy. Now, I don't want to put that kind of bad mark on Tom, but at the same time, man, like, you know, read the writing on the wall. You've done it. I just don't know how you can get any higher. It's so hard to win championships. I mean, they wouldn't have won the last one if Pete Carroll hadn't have called that pass on the, uh, on the yeah. goal line. You hand it to Marshawn Lynch. Yeah, I know. Uh, so it could have been, you know, his fourth Super Bowl ring rather than his fifth. Yeah, yeah. Had they called a different play. But as hard as it is to get there, and hell, there was a period after they won that one. It was I think there was a seven or eight, nine, ten year period before they went back. Yeah. So it, it could be the right time to ride off in the sunset. We'll see. Last thing, yeah. you got anything to plug, promote, talk about? We've been talking. Anything you need to uh, plug? No, man. You know what? Uh, I just say to anybody out there, if you uh, are interested in this podcast, uh, keep on listening to Steve. But if you're interested in what I've been talking about, just reach out to me any point in time. My name's Hunt the Sheriff on most social media channels, and uh, you'll find me somewhere, man. I'm always willing to connect. Uh, if you ever want to work out in L.A. or just want to you know, pick my brain, I'm an open-ended book. Hey, man. It was good talking to you. Of course, Steve. Always a pleasure. All right, everybody, give me the go-home cue. It's time to wrap up this podcast and ride off in the sunset. Before I do that, I want to thank Hunter McIntyre for coming over here to the crib at 317 Gimmick Street with all my blankets and jackets and pillows scattered everywhere for sound control and sharing some of his story with me. We'll see how Hunter does in the future with his obstacle course racing and his Spartan racing and whatever endeavors he chooses to pursue in his life. Good luck, Hunter. It was good talking to you. You represented the Broken Skull Challenge in a badass fashion. Hey, man, all my T-shirts, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Steve Austin. All those shirts I wore while filming the toughest goddamn show in the history of television, the Broken Skull Challenge on CMT. That's where you can find those shirts at, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Steve Austin or BrokenSkullRanch.com. And if you're thirsty and you want a badass IPA to drink, the best IPA in the USA my Broken Skull IPA at El Segundo Brewing Company. You can find it at Whole Foods and Total Wines if you live in California. If you ain't in Cali, check inside the seller.com and see if they ship to your state. And I appreciate y'all supporting the sponsors of Steve Austin Podcast. They're the ones that let me do this for you free twice a week, and that includes Amazon. And Amazon is the best place to get the Cold Steel Broken Skull Knife for just 75 bucks. And if you order the Cold Steel Broken Skull Knife through my Amazon links, Amazon will kick back a couple of bucks to the podcast. Never cost you anything extra. Never any hidden fees or charges. You can buy whatever you plan on buying to help out the podcast in the process. And you can buy my Amazon links by going to podcastone.com. Clicking on the Killer Deals button in the top right corner of the page and hitting the Steve Austin Show button. I got Amazon links for USA, UK, and Canada. So again, go to podcastone.com, click the Killer Deals button in the top right corner, then click on the Steve Austin Show. Hey, keep listening to 60 Second AP News headlines are coming up next. Until then, my name is Steve Austin, and I will catch your ass down the road. Download new episodes of Steve Austin Unleashed every Thursday at podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. Stay tuned for the latest AP News headlines from Podcast One right after this. The Angry President. I'm Rita Foley with an AP News Minute. We've learned that President Trump was seething when he fired FBI Director James Comey. He felt Comey let the FBI's Russia investigation play out in the press, we're told. Former Trump campaign advisor Roger Stone tells the Today Show this morning... The Trump presidential campaign did not collude with Moscow. The idea of Russian collusion is a canard. It's a falsehood. Earlier on the Today Show, White House Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders was asked about a line in the president's termination letter to Comey that read, I greatly appreciate you informing me on three separate occasions that I am not under investigation. Some have called that statement into question. 
Sanders was asked about it. Uh, look, I, I'm not sure on the, the reasoning behind that exact part being in there, but I do know uh, I spoke to the president directly, and he said that those uh, moments and conversations did take place. I'm Rita Foley.